for the invitation and for allowing me to, to say a few words about the future of energy and coal. And I would say we're certainly in a very special time, not only because of COVID, but we know because of energy. And um, I'll start with a bit of a disclaimer. The usual, what I say is my opinion, not our company's opinion. I do recommend always do check everything yourself. Um, one other thing I, I'm supposed to say now even more is probably like a personal disclaimer. Um, I'm not a climate change denier. It's very important because you know we're clearly and very quickly labeled that. Um, I'm also not a denier of science, quite the contrary. I'm very interested in science, understanding what's behind it. And I'm also not political. Um, the entire discussion about energy and climate change becomes so political that you know just by saying something, you're right away pushed into a certain um, um, uh, right wing, usually. Yeah. Um, I am from the coal industry, and in fact, I do love my job, and thus I am biased, so I totally admit that, and when you listen to me, please, please consider that. Um, I will talk about things that are in dispute, um, and I will talk about things that are not in dispute, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, not in dispute, it's just often something that is not talked about. Um, you know, I, I talk about and, and things that are very, very clear, that are just not discussed publicly, and that is something we have to be very careful going forward. So that's my personal disclaimer. And then we can start. Um, our company, HMS, many of you know, not all of you, we've been in the, in the business for over 45 years and um, active in coal, ore, mat ore materials, raw materials, cementitious products worldwide. Okay, on the content, uh, let's start positive. The last decade was actually the best decade ever in human history. And that is, in my view, not in dispute. It's just not talked about because positive news doesn't sell. Um, Extreme poverty has been cut in half. And in fact, um, one of the uh, Swedish uh, authors uh, said this uh, uh, just in December, it's hard to believe that, but the last decade was the best ever. I found it on a UNICEF itself, that's why I took it. And why was the best one? Best one, because poverty, which is this dark area here at the bottom, has been declining, continues to decline. So in fact, we have less poverty today than we used to have. An important other aspect of this slide, and I apologize, a bit full, is this growth in population that we've had. And in fact, we in the past 100 years, we added 6 billion people to our population, from 2 to 8 billion. And in fact, there's 3 more billion to come. That's important when we go on in the presentation. So um, yes, we had the best decade ever. But yes, we are in the biggest crisis in decades. And that, of course, has to do with the current virus that we are experiencing. These are just some of the GDP numbers. China on top is going to outpace all of us. Um, but that crisis goes on because CNN in April said that the Pope says the coronavirus could be nature's response to climate crisis. Now, of course, I would say that's highly in dispute, but that is what we're dealing with. And that gets me to the second point or the next point, the coal and the fossil fuels in total face probably maybe an even bigger crisis. And we better wake up. We are in a crisis. We are under attack. The coal industry is under attack. And this has to do with the competition from gas and nuclear that coal is facing, divestments issues we're facing, right? the growing share of renewables around the world, geopolitics, Australia, US versus China, large issues that, that affect the coal industry. There's a general polarization about positions in the world. right? There's more extreme positions between left and right and green and not green and all those things. Um, and then, of course, there's long-term demand and supply issues in coking coal, even in steam coal. Indonesia trying to protect their, 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 own, their own resources, Colombia reducing exports. There's many examples of this. And, uh, and then there's the environment, right? There's clean coal issues, clean steel issues, carbon capture and storage, pollution. All those things are something that cause our industry to be under significant stress. And of course, there's the element, an elephant in the room, which is the so-called catastrophic climate change. And I would say the Western political war against coal. Now, um, coal can hide, the industry can hide, or it can fight, fight back. And I will speak about this in this presentation, and I'll end with five points with certain recommendations. But you have to consider that there is larger and smaller mining companies. And those larger mining companies are so entrenched in a political system that it will be more difficult for them to fight anything of this. They will just kind of consider, yes, yes, we will you know, we'll behave, we'll do this, we'll do that. But uh, I'm independent, I can say whatever I want to say, but unfortunately, few larger companies are. So decarbonization in the European Union, you heard about the Green New Deal also in Europe uh, in December last year. They want to decarbonize by 2050. And um, okay, 
that I say it's in dispute, at least, at least the logic and the feasibility is in dispute, that's what I would say. Um, and then the European Union put in a COVID rescue package, almost $700 billion to rescue the economy from this current COVID pandemic. And at the same time, they said, oh, by the way, 30% of this money, the 200 billion plus has to be put into climate mitigation or whatever. That means there's $200 billion out of a fund that's supposed to save the economy that goes now into something that's actually political and supposed to save the climate. And we'll talk about that. Um, life without fossils is only decades away, question mark. That is what we're hearing, right? That's what we're seeing, that um, life without fossils is gonna be away. Well, this is not in dispute. This is the history of primary energy in the past 150, 170 years. And you can see how the energy cons uh, um, pr consumption and, 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 and production, every means, has increased over the years. And something that we keep forgetting that wind and solar made up 3% last year. Now, something we also keep forgetting is that fossils, that means coal, oil, and gas, made up 84%. So that's not in dispute. And the coal industry contributes over one third of electricity, actually over 35% of electricity, and contributes over one fourth of primary energy. So we're not the bad guys um, because of carbon and because of you know, climate change, but in fact, without coal industry, nothing would move and without oil and gas neither. So when we now talk about the future, there's also no dispute that that energy demand is gonna go up 70% in the next 30 years. So now think about it, what's going to happen, right? We have 3% wind and solar. There's 200 billion just from Europe going into wind and solar. So even if wind and solar quadruples 10 times increases, it's not going to happen or not going to save uh, you know, the world or, or give us the energy we need in the future. So um, the politicians say, yes, fossil fuels is decades away. And um, I've just downloaded a recent slide from the IEA about um, the carbon emissions, right? CO2, CO2 emissions, not carbon, or CO2 emissions. And you can see that, you know, we're roughly at 35 billion tons, and you can see this COVID drop here in 2020, but other than that, it has been going up. So now we know, remember, that 70% more energy is coming up here, and yet we're supposed to go down to zero with carbon emissions. Now, this is from the IEA, just assuming we would stop building any infrastructure at all. We just use current infrastructure and what's currently under construction. That is what carbons would do as per the IEA. In fact, remember again, in the past 70 years, we added 5 billion people and energy demand was up five times. In the next 50 years, we'll add another 2 billion people and energy demand will be up two times. So at the same time, we're gonna stop building any new infrastructure and we're gonna give all the energy we need basically from wind and solar because there's nothing else. Um, now, when you put the emission pathway in, and uh, sorry, the slide becomes a bit full, but if you were to manage the 1.5 degree target, so-called target, with 66% probability, you would have to be carbon neutral by 2035. The two degree target would be, you would have to be carbon neutral by 2070. Now, let me be clear, I have never met any single person in energy or in, in, uh, in anything related to energy in an individual discussion that says this is possible. It's actually impossible. Even if everything is true about you know, climate change and all those things, it's impossible to do this. So climate mitigation with wind and solar versus climate adaptation, what is doable, right? Are we gonna continue pumping billions, trillions of dollars into trying to mitigate the climate hoping that, you know, that will actually change the climate? Or are we gonna start spending money on adapting to something where we see changes? So that's just the question I want you to keep in mind. Now, one step back, energy policy. What is energy policy? Energy policy has actually three objectives. It is about security of supply. It is about affordability of supply. And it is about environmental protection. There's no dispute about this. Now, environmental protection includes a few things. I put climate on top here, just for the sake of it. There's pollution, there's plants and animals, there's land and space, there's material input, there's energy input. There's a lot of issues that have to do with climate and environmental protection. Now, somehow, it's all gone down the drain. 
Today, energy policy is about decarbonization and trying to save the climate. And I had to put this up, but the IEA, which is supposed to be the most independent, large worldwide energy agency that's supposed to watch out for this triangle of climate uh, uh, energy objectives, tells us that solar is becoming the new king of the world's electricity market. Now, the reason why they're saying is because there's so much money pumped into solar that it appears to be the new king, but it cannot be the new king, and I'll tell you why in a few seconds. So today's energy policy, in my view, goes against all three objectives. Because wind and solar will not give you security of supply. It will not give you affordable supply, even though you hear differently. It will not give you environmental protection other than pollution, maybe the climate, I don't know. That is for others to find out. But it's not good for plants and animals. It's not good for land and space. It's not good in terms of material input required to build this infrastructure or for the energy input required to build this infrastructure. So how come the energy policy has come all about the climate and we keep forgetting about all these big things? I think that's something we as the coal industry have to start pointing out. Now, there's another piece of good news. So the IEEJ, the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan, just beginning of the year, gave a forecast in their reference scenario about the coal industry and the future. That might be in dispute, but that is something that I personally um, um, support. So the IEJ says that actually the coal industry which is roughly 8 billion tons is not going to peak until 2040 and even after it's going to stay quite stable because they realize right now we do not have another solution. We have oil, we have gas, we have coal, we have nuclear, and then we have renewables, right? And, and hydro and, and biomass are limited in how they grow. So there's only wind and solar really about new. And those we talk about what the issues are. So anyways, and some of the good news is that not all energy agencies in the world believe what the IEA says. The IE, IEJ in Japan, probably the second best in the world, has a more realistic view. And I think we as a coal industry should start work, work, uh, working with those data. Now, sustainability in a world of catastrophic climate change, there's two approaches. We can discuss causes of global warming and how catastrophic this global warming is, or we can discuss how to protect our environment and the climate if you want to, right? So I believe there's no dispute that the world is warming and that humans are contributing to warming. Absolutely, no dispute. I believe there's very much a dispute. How much warming did we have? Will we have? How much warming will we have? There's a big dispute about that. There is a dispute about how much, CO, how much does CO2 contribute to warming. I'll show you why later. Right now it says, no, there's no dispute. Of course there's a dispute. There is a dispute um, about how catastrophic any warming is, sea levels, extreme weather events. But we're not allowed to speak about this. That's heretic. That's not really cool. Stay away from it. You're going to be pushed in the corner. Maybe we'd better speak about, you know, if we were to accept that CO2 needs to be reduced and that decarbonization does help us, then would the transition to solar help or transition to wind or transition to electric vehicles or hydrogen, will that help? I believe there's a dispute here, um, even though you might hear differently, but that's not clear. And what will truly help our environment? That's something we have to figure out. I don't have the answer. Um, I just know that what we're currently doing, in my view, is not helping the environment, or at least only partially, minimally helping the environment. So my own country, Germany, um, is probably one of the leaders in the world. Um, in 2018, it was 35% of, uh, of power coming from renewables, actually 25% of wind and solar. Now it's probably 40%. Of course, oops, Germany has the highest cost of power in the world. Hmm, that's a bit strange. Isn't wind and solar supposed to be the cheapest source of power? Why does Germany have the highest cost of power if they are the, the, the furthest developed from the large nations into wind and solar? Well, because wind and solar are not the cheapest and they're not cheaper. And uh, there's actually no dispute about that. There's also no dispute about these numbers that you see. Yeah. So let me try to explain. Um, in Germany on the 4th of July, nice date, there was in the news a new record that 97% of renewables, wow, Germany made the energy transition, 97% of renewables, amazing. Well, I look into it a little bit more detailed. And this is online from Agora. And you can see that actually this 97% was for one hour at 3 p.m. on the 4th of July where 97% of renewables in the system. Great. What they didn't tell you is that at that, at that time, you had 15 gigawatt or 22% of waste power. That power had to be basically dumped on the European market at negative prices to get rid of it. What they also didn't tell you is just a few days later, on the 18th of July at 9 p.m., there was 0% wind and solar in the system, zero. There was only 
hydro and biomass, which is very stable at the bottom. You can see this down here at the bottom, right? So there was zero wind and solar in the system. So all this conventional, this gay area had to manage. They also didn't tell you that there was a shortage of four gigawatt during that hour. What did they do? They had to import the power. Now what Germany is doing, they're trying to reduce this gray area here to wind, uh, coal, and nuclear is going down. So that charge is going to go going to increase. And even if you double, triple, 10 times, 1,000 times your wind and solar, you're still going to have this, this problem here. So this is the Minister of, uh, of Environment in Germany in July said, Germany is now globally the first industrial nation to leave coal and nuclear behind. We will rely on wind and solar for the complete 100% of energy supply. There's three Ps here, sorry about that. I don't know, how can a minister say something like this? I mean, it's so wrong in so many aspects, it's just incredible. Number one, she forgot about hydro and, 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 and biomass. Number two, it's impossible. We just realized that, right? So also Germany just this month started discussing that wind may become a matter of national security in Germany. What does it mean? Well, that means that any German, any wind installation could basically be pushed through for national security reasons. Wow. I mean, hold on, we're trying to, to, to put something into the system that gives us less security of supply, increases costs, and we're gonna make a national security to make sure we're gonna put more into the system. I question that. That's why I say it's a dispute. Now, wind. You can see the wind map in Europe. You see a lot of wind here in the North Sea, especially in the UK. This is from Global Wind Atlas. And now when you go over to Asia, you see how little wind there is. So even if, if wind did make sense, there's just not enough wind in the growing nations. So what are these guys gonna do? It's not gonna work, right? Wind is not a solution. Now solar, you see the solar map, again, not in dispute. So, you know, here in Europe, you have a little bit less sun up here. And Spain is actually the, the, the richest sun nation in Europe, still less than Arizona in the US, still less than the Sahara, of course, right? But what you notice is that Asia has less sun than Spain on average, right? Because of clouds and rain and all those things. So again, we're gonna have, we have more sun in Spain than we have in Asia. Well, let me give you an example. And sorry about this. I made a calculation. I will publish something next, next month about this. If we were to go, 100% solar in Spain to power Germany. I'm going to, I would have to make some assumptions. Don't worry about how much power we need, how much sun there is, AC transmission capacity factors, all those things. And out comes how much capacity of solar I have to build, um, how much buffer storage I need. And, and the summary comes to this. Germany has 2% of CO2 emissions globally. If I were to cover Germany with solar from Spain, 100%, no wind, no nuclear, no nothing else, I would have to cover 10% of Spain in panels. Simple calculation, you can make it yourself, I'll, I'll publish this. You would have to uh, dig up and process billions of tons of materials to build batteries annually, because the batteries last 20 years, it means you have to replace one 20th every year. The same solar panels last maybe 15 years. So that means you have to build every year new panels. You have to build every year 3,000 square kilometers of panels. Now you would need 10% of global silicon production for those 3,000 square kilometers of panels. By the way, silicon is made of quartz sand and coal because you need to reduce the quartz sand, the, the, the silicon oxide, you need to reduce the oxide, oxygen with coal, same you reduce iron ore at 2,000 degrees. Nothing you, you hear about. I say here is no dispute because these are things you don't hear about, but it's simple calculation, simple math. And you need 35% of global silver production. So now I question, if it doesn't make sense to power 100% of Germany with solar from Spain, does it make any sense to try to cover a, a, por a portion of Germany's power demand by solar with any solar panel further north of Spain where there's even less sun? Well, I leave that question open. Now, I'm not saying that all solar and all wind is bad. I'm just saying that solar and wind will not be the solution to our future power systems. So let's talk about the cost of power. I used here Vietnam as an example, and you can see there's cost of coal, there's cost of gas, and there's cost of solar and wind. And we see everywhere in the press that the cost of solar goes down, the cost of wind goes down, and soon it will be the cheapest source of power. Now, we talked about earlier in Germany, if that was the case, why does Germany have the highest cost of a price of power? Well, this is not true, right? It's misleading. You cannot compare base load intermittent, intermittent power. This is a misleading graph. And what you're missing is a large portion of cost 
what we call integration costs of variable renewable energy. That is, the system has to pay for that. What is that? Well, again, the IEJ, the Japanese uh, uh, Energy Institute, um, calls this VRE, and they have this illust illust illustrative um, uh, graph where they show the more wind and solar you put into the system, renewable, variable renewable power is basically wind and solar, the higher the cost becomes. Why is that? That is because you need to have a backup all the time, right? We saw in Germany before, when that wind and solar is not there, you need to turn on something. That something costs, it's backup cost, right? You need to interconnection costs. You need to have smart grids. You know, there's, there's additional costs with interconnecting this variable renewable power. Now, this is not in dispute. Even the IEA agrees. They call it value adjusted level as cost of electricity. It's just something you don't read. When you look at IEA's Twitters, they will not mention any of this. You have to go deep on the website to find it. Okay. Now, any of these do not consider other costs. They don't consider the material energy cost to build renewable power. It's not considered in any of these. Efficiency losses because the, your backup is going to be used less. You know, when you drive a car continuously for one hour, it loses less. It's, it's more efficient than turning on or on off your car every five seconds, you know, uh, because, you know, sometimes you need to drive something, you don't need to drive. Yeah. Uh, there's room cost, the cost of, you know, plastering, you know, um, uh, the world with solar panels or with windmills. There's the cost to this. There's the cost for animals, there's cropland, forests. Right, um, changing wind and local climate patterns. This is why I call it room cost, it's not considered. And then of course, it's a recycling cost. You need to recycle this stuff after 15 or 20 years. So I hope it becomes obvious to you that wind and solar are not cheaper than coal, uh, than coal and gas. In fact, they will never ever be cheaper than, 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 than fossil fuels. They will only be always become more and more expensive the higher, the more you put into the system. So another example on storage. Um, Tesla, amazing, crazy car. I just love driving it. Uh, it's so fast. Yeah? So a Tesla battery, it's probably, you know, the most advanced um, um, battery uh, system we have today, um, has 85 kilowatt hour capacity and weighs about half a ton. And um, now coal cannot really compare it, but yes, you can, because fossil fuel actually is stored energy. It is storage, right? It's just a one-time use storage. And to store the same amount of energy that one Tesla battery stores, you need 30 kilograms of coal that you burn in a power plant. It's already after efficiency loss of the power plant. So there's an energy density factor of 41 of 18 after efficiency, something you don't hear about. It's not in dispute, okay? Now, in order to build this battery, you need a lot of materials. It's all also not in dispute, just not talked about. And, um, if you generously assume that one to 2% of mined ore actually ends up in the battery, that means you would need 13 to 25 tons of raw materials that need to be mined, processed, and transported. And I already was generous in half the battery rate for future efficiency. So with a one to 10 OB ratio, you're talking 130 to 250 tons of earth moving. Lithium, copper, cobalt, nickel, graphite, rare earth, bauxite, iron ore, all those things you need. Coal, 30 kilograms, right? That's all you need to mine. So the mining impact of building these, these storage um, units, very few people are talking about it. Why? I don't know. It's just not cool, but it's not in dispute. Yeah? So there's a material input factor of 450 to 850. An energy input factor, I don't know. It takes much more energy to build this unit of, of storage than to build this, including the power plant. It's much less energy efficient. So I found this global mineral use, and you can see that 50 years ago, we mined 25 billion tons of material from our ground. Today, we mine 95 billion tons of material. That includes 8 billion tons of coal. I mean, right now with this energy transition, are we becoming more efficient about the resource use in our world or are we becoming less efficient? Well, there's no question of becoming less efficient, right? So, um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about gas. Now, I'm all for gas. Gas is an amazing resource, and gas is very, very necessary. But the Ger German government just a couple of weeks ago said liquefied gas from shale gas is as environmentally unfriendly as coal and oil. Wow. We always hear gas is better for the climate. We need to switch to gas. The whole world switches from coal to gas. Well, in fact, there's a global warming potential of, of, uh, of methane is uh, 84 to 87 times worse than CO2 over 20 years, not in dispute. No question, IPCC official numbers. Over 100 years is 28 to 30, 36. Now, 20 years is more relevant because we're saying we're now need to act now, not in the future, right? 
So why? Because during combustion, gas emits half the CO2, but you have transportation and processing where you have leakages. LNG tankers take, take, uh, take gas. And then you have production where you have flares, losses, and all those things. And again, there's no dispute these things are happening. There's a dispute about the actual numbers. Uh, and they're probably much higher than they ever hear about them because which gas producer actually knows or will even tell you how much gas they see uh, methane they lose. Well, I can tell you one thing, at 8% methane leakage, you would break even with coal. So I'm all for gas, it's important in the energy mix, but any claim that gas emits half the CO2 equivalent of coal are only considering combustion are simply wrong. Why can the coal industry not say that? What's wrong with this? I mean, the gas industry is fighting against coal and, and we should be together. Coal and gas should be together, not against each other. But switching from coal to gas for the climate is not helping. And even Bill Gates said that himself, he said, or he said that renewables won't stop global warming. Um, but he also said the forcing function of gas is sooner converting coal to natural gas for the next 50 years and then shutting it down is a net addition to emission. So again, it's not a dispute. This whole thing seems to be obvious and clear to everyone, it's just not talked about. So hydrogen, well, let's talk about hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is a very energy dense material different from, from, from a battery, right, uh, from a Tesla battery. But how much, what is an energy? Remember 85 kilowatt hours of, uh, of uh, energy that, uh, that a Tesla battery has. What is one kilowatt hour? Well, one kilowatt hour is lifting up a 10 kilogram stone for 36 kilometers. If you do that, if you lift a 10, 10 kilogram stone 36 kilometers, then you have potential energy equaling to one kilowatt hour. Just to give you a sense, of one, one kilowatt is a lot, right? Now, you may also remember when you have green energy, wind and solar, that green energy can only do one thing. It can either, either you know, power my house or it can produce energy, uh, hydrogen, because I talk about green hydrogen. So that means you can only use the excessive green energy, the excessive green energy available in the system to produce hydrogen. Otherwise, you take it away from someone else. Now, Germany had uh, 5,500 gigawatt hours of excessive renewable energy. We talked about before, they dumped it somewhere on, uh, in Europe at negative prices. Um, and if you make the calculation, um, divide by 24 hours, 365 days, you come to 600 megawatt, and you come to about 6.0.8% of Germany's full load is available in excessive green energy last year. If we double, triple, 10 times our increase, of course, there will be more. It will be just very expensive. Now, if you use hydrogen as a backup for power, I'm not now talking about driving a car, okay? I'm not talking about using hydrogen as a backup to store green energy to make power out of it because that's what we're told is gonna to happen. So you use this green energy very intermittent on and off and with like electrolysis you make um, um, hydrogen. Now I don't know any electrolysis today that can work with purely intermittent power from wind and solar. As far as I know, they need a more stable power but maybe that will be solved. So there's a 50 to 70% um, efficiency utilizing that, you doing that. Next step you do, you methanize the, uh, the hydrogen by adding carbon dioxide, great, you take carbon dioxide away, you methanize it and you make um, methane. And again, you have 30 to 40% of efficiency. Now next, you go into a, natural, a, 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 a gas boiler, right? And you, you, you produce uh, power at 45 to 50% efficiency. When you add all this up, you come to 12% net efficiency. So now remember before we had 0.8% of Germany's power, 0.8% times 12%, that means you can actually, with today's Germany excessive green energy, you can, you can maybe generate power of 0.1% of your full load requirement. So you would have to increase excessive capacity by a thousand times to get to 100%. And the costs are gonna be so ridiculous, I can't even tell you. So this anti-hydrogen discussion is a very interesting one. You have to be careful about just the physics and laws of, of energy. It's not gonna be the solution. Hydrogen will have away in certain areas and application is not going to change our energy system worldwide. Science is the belief in the ignorance of expert. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner said that science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Interesting one. And then um, Harari said experts argue schools should be teaching critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. I am missing critical thinking in today's energy policy. It's not even allowed to think critically. There's not a dispute about these things that are said. These are all true statements. And what we're currently doing is just absolutely terrible for our world, for our environment. And, and the coal industry should be able to say these things loud. 
uh, because we're under attack and if we don't say anything, we're just gonna go down quicker and quicker and quicker. Now, all life on earth depends on one single formula. We learned this in biology, right? More CO2, more life. Oops. So carbon dioxide and water with sun, sun energy gives me sugars and oxygen, right? There's no dispute that the world has been greening over the past 30 years because it's been slightly warmer, because there's been more CO2 in the atmosphere. We cannot say this, but it's true, there's no dispute. It's greener today. And the world needs to produce 60 to 70% more food but in, the next, uh, in the next years. And every greenhouse that produces anything that's bio injects CO2 that things grow faster. CO2 is a key building block of life, it's not pollution. It does contribute to slight warming, but that's a different story. That positive news about CO2, we should be able to say as the coal industry. It's a fact, it's true. And of course, the CO2 also comes from coal. In fact, the CO2 that the coal power plant emits gives me always additional biomass, and it gives me two times more biomass than a gas-fired power plant, because gas emits half the CO2 during burning. And, 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 uh, and, uh, um, and nuclear gives me zero CO2, right? Why can we not give this positive message? Um, now I'm gonna skip this about, uh, uh, about the, uh, the ice, actually maybe not. So Arctic versus, versus Antarctic. Now the Arctic is in the North, it's 4 million square kilometers. It's mostly on ice, uh, ice on water. That's where our lovely um, polar bears are. By the way, there's also more polar bears today than 30 years ago, uh, even though you hear differently, it's not in dispute. Now, the Antarctic in the south, that's where the penguins are, that's mostly ice on land. So um, you may also remember in your physics class that ice that swims on water when it melts cannot increase the level of liquids in your glass. So that means when the Arctic melts, other than Greenland, and Greenland is an important one, we will not have any increased sea level. That's no dispute, no physical uh, clarity. But when the snow mass increases in the Antarctic, that snow, that, that moisture has to come from somewhere, it actually reduces sea levels. And there might be a disputable peer-reviewed study that says that the Antarctic South has been net decreasing sea levels by a minimal, you know, whatever, basically zero, like a couple of percentage of millimeters. Um, now, the, uh, oh, this should be on, on, on Greenland. Greenland loses 145 gigatons of ice per annum. That's 0.01 to 0.005% of the total of 1.2 to 2.8 million gigatons of ice. It's a lot of ice being lost, but it's a small fraction of what is there. I'm not saying it's good that this thing is melting, but I'm just saying put things into perspective a little bit. And um, here I put you um, uh, one more interesting point um, for our discussion. Now, remember our earlier slides, you know how the energy use of energy went up, primary energy went up to 500, 600 exajoule. Well, these are the 500, 600 exajoules. And this energy, where does this energy go? Well, it goes into operating our lives, operating energy. Assume 90% of energy used for operating our lives. I don't know how much it is exactly. And then assume that 10% actually ends, ends up in embodied energy. You know, aluminum has a very strong embodied energy. Aluminum takes so much energy to build. So when you have an aluminum product, that itself is energy. It's chemical energy, right? So let's assume 10% of that goes in there. Now, at the bottom, the operating energy, all of this ends up in heat, right? To, 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 uh, when, I, when I charge my phone, that phone, all the energy ends up in heat. When I drive a car, it ends up in heat. All the loss of operating a plant ends up in heat, right? How much heat, how much heat goes out there? Well, 500 exajoule, right? Or 550 exajoule, 90% of this. And that equals, 1,400 gigatons of ice melting every year to compensate. It's a theoretical illustrative discussion, but I just want to sense the energy that, put, that we put out there into the world, the heat equals the same energy it takes to melt 1,400 gigatons of ice. Now remember before, on the slide before we said, um, uh, Greenland loses 145 uh, uh, gigatons of, uh, of ice. This is not in dispute guys, okay? Now this area covers France, Spain, and Germany with one meter thick layer of ice every year would have to melt or 10 centimeter layer of ice, entire Australia and Brazil. So this is every year. 
Now, one point of caution, the sun is much stronger than the heat we put out there, right? The, the, the minuscule changes in sun energy and global on our, on our planet is much, much larger than what we are emitting in heat. But I just want to put into perspective what we are putting out here does have an impact on our planet and also on certain temperatures. It's warmer in cities and outside cities. That's because of humans. So <clears throat> I talked about this, right? Um, sea levels, we can skip that. One more important point, I know it's technical, but also you should know in the industry as to know, and there's no dispute about this, that the warming potential of carbon dioxide logarithmically declines the more you put into the system. So every additional ton of carbon dioxide you put into the system has less warming effect. It's not talked about, but it's not in dispute. What seems to be in dispute is the climate models. Now this is the official climate models, okay? There's a hundred and something climate models in the world and they give me warming per decade, or let's say per hundred years, four degrees, one degree to 44 degrees per, for, per hundred years. And this is the average. Well, one thing seems clear, there's no dispute that there's dispute amongst models, how much warming CO2 will give us. Now, because there's dispute among models, they say, oh, let's assume the worst case. And these models that are in dispute, right? They are now putting out, um, um, they are now putting out, um, scenarios. And based on these scenarios, um, we are hearing everything we're hearing. Now, there's a, a, a recent study just from this year that the global, the amount of global warming expected is heavily determined by what we call climate sensitivity, right? The exact value of this metric is the subject of considerable ongoing scientific debate. There is a debate. Science is not settled, okay? Um, but we're they're settled that let's, let's, let's use whatever we have. We're unsure about it. Let's make scenarios based on this. And then let's assume the worst case and then see what happens. And you may have heard about this RCP 8.5, RCP 2.6. Well, when you look at the press, McKinsey, BCG, the large, you know, glossy um, and, and papers, they will tell you what happens if we were to use RCP 8.5 scenario. So we're using these un in incomplete, unsure climate models. These climate models then give scenarios worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. We take the worst case scenarios of the worst model here. And you can see here that the, the worst case scenario assumes that the emissions go up here. Completely unrealistic, we are down here, right? I mean, most likely is here, this case maybe like a two and a half degrees, like the RCP 2.6, but RCP, RCP uh, 8.5 gives us like an emission scenario where we are going to five times increase our carbon dioxide emissions in the next uh, 50 years. I mean, it's crazy, no way we're gonna do that. So be careful about what you read projections into the future. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, for 1.5, for limiting the 1.5 temperature increase since pre-industrial times, we are 0.5 degrees left. Now, um, I'm gonna skip this, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna say one more point about um, freedom of speech. The Economist just this weekend had this on their cover, right? Who controls the conversation? social media and free speech. It's a very, very good point. The Economist is a very good, or, or a good, uh, good newspaper. They have a very strong view on climate change, but that's one thing. On the other thing, it's still a very strong, uh, strong paper. And just to give you an example, Facebook has what they call fact checkers. And Professor Patrick Michaels, who's a colleague of mine in one of our organizations, says, claim that humans are only responsible for half of the past global warming. So he said that humans contributed half of the global warming of the past 150 years. That was labeled incorrect by a fact checker called climatefeedback.org, which is employed by, um, by Facebook. And uh, of course, climatefeedback.org is a very biased organization, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the same like I would be doing a fact check. Yeah? Um, it's incredible. So Professor Patrick Michael's post was, was, was scrapped. You will not be able to see it. Wikipedia has taken off scientists on their website, scientists who have questions about current global 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 warming discussion. I mean, this this uh, this discussion is the freedom of speech is gone. It's not there anymore. But we as the coal industry, we have to start waking up and taking a stand. Okay, and this is where I come to the end of my presentation. Um, again, I believe we need to take a stand. Yeah? And again, large companies will struggle doing taking the stand if it comes to the medium sized miners in the world uh, and the independent ones to take this up. But in my view, there's five points. Number one, we do support uh, environmental protection and we need to do everything to minimize ecological footprint, everything, right? 
we argue for climate adaptation instead of climate mitigation with wind and solar because the adaptation makes sense mitigation makes no sense especially, especially because we don't know what's going to happen and especially not with wind and solar and i remind you here of the 90 billion tons of mining that are happening in the world and the, how that's going to increase if you were to go renewable right second point we support gas but the switch from coal to gas does not support the climate even by the models um, predicted um, 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 by the by the scientists now um, I don't think that CH4 or CO2 is, is a main contributor in the future. It will be a main issue. I rather believe that carbon dioxide is a positive impact, but by the models, coal to gas switching is not gonna change the, the climate. Okay, that's an important argument we have to bring out there. Next one, wind, solar, and batteries at industrial levels are detrimental to the environment, right? And the levelized cost of electricity, electricity is not the correct measure. Cost of wind and solar increases with its share in the system. This is not in dispute, guys. There's no question about this. And please remember all these things, energy density, material input, energy input, conversion of efficiency with hydrogen, right? The room costs and how much it takes to actually plaster our, our world with, with uh, uh, wind, wind, uh, wind farms and solar panels. And the fourth, CO2 is basis for life. More CO2, more life. The warming impact, logarithmic declines. Not in dispute, we can say this. Nobody says, why can we not say it, right? And, and fifth, Coal, gas, oil, and nuclear are urgently needed until what I call the new energy revolution, right? Environmentally sound is to invest in fossil fuels to make them more efficient and green, not to devise from them. That's an argument that's so obvious, so logic for any economist, any energy specialist will tell you, of course, we need to have money for this to make it better until we found a solution. Wind and solar is not a solution. Yeah. So the coal industry has to admit to itself that it's based on carbon and five and fight misinformation and fight missing information. And that is how I would like to kick off this discussion here uh, at Coltrans. And we will have amazing presentations coming up. Uh, people will give us a lot of input, you know, about the market, about, you know, politics, about what's happening. But I hope that this presentation gave you an overview, an idea about what's happening out there and maybe give you some food for thought.